Sunday, 13 August 1944, a beautiful sunny day in Italy. At the South African Air Force or SAF base camp of Ciloni, the white flag was hoisted and meant no flying that day. Air crews of 31 bomber squadron were standing down. Suddenly, alarm was sounded and 10 air crews were instructed to fly down to Brindisi to receive special orders. The men hastily boarded their Liberator bombers and set off to Brindisi. These men had no idea that they would soon be embarking on one of the most daring and tragic series of missions ever flown by the SAF. Um, we got down to Brindisi and walked into uh, the operations room of RAF 178 Squadron and on, plastered on one wall, a very big wall, was a huge map of Europe and outlined in black tape starting from was a, a, a route marker starting from Brindisi going across the Adriatic zigzagging over seven countries right down into the Balkans and then right up over Hungary uh, and uh, over the uh, Carpathians and uh, and then dropping down into Poland. And we all said, geez, which crazy guys did that? I'm sure. I'm so glad that that's not us doing that. And of course, the, the briefing started with the RAF wing commander standing up with traditional words saying, gentlemen, your target for tonight is Warsaw. And... Uh, I think we all fell about uh, with shock. Who could, uh, in their right senses, ask anyone to do that? Because not only at normal height of, say, 12,000 feet, we were going in at, at, at 450 feet. That is very, very low, because we were going to deliver our load to virtual street addresses. Lieutenant Brian Jones's squadron was part of a large airlift operation involving several squadrons to help the Polish resistance with supplies. The Polish Home Army launched its uprising on the 1st of August 1944 in an attempt to seize Warsaw from the Germans before it was overrun by the Red Army. The Home Army managed to occupy large areas of downtown Warsaw, but failed to secure the four bridges over the Vistula River. They were therefore unable to hold the eastern suburbs of the city. With no support forthcoming from the Red Army, German counter-attacks resulted in the Polish Home Army being systematically destroyed. The plight of the Poles captured the imagination of the Western Allies. The British RAF and South African Air Force answered the call. It was decided to fly missions from bases in Italy. These would involve great risk as the distances to be flown were at the utmost limits of the aircraft's range. Brigadier Jimmy Durrant, the officer commanding 205 Group RAF Bomber Command in Italy, assigned five squadrons to this task. Two from the SAF and three from the RAF including a special Polish flight. On the 13th of August 1944, the South Africans flew their first mission and continued with two more follow-up flights. The SAF's final two missions were flown in mid-September, but by then, further supply drops to Warsaw had been halted. The Polish Home Army was finally crushed and it surrendered to German forces on the 2nd of October, 1944. The Warsaw flights were extremely high risk. 31 Squadron's commander, Dirk Nell, complained to his superiors. The question that she asked, and you asked that I was against the Warsaw. It came about when Churchill said that military-wise, it is of no importance. It is for the political future. It is then, with, uh, as I said, that Churchill must risk his own life for his own political future and not expect uh, voluntary South Africans 
My words were at the time, it's a mission impossible. Notwithstanding NAL's objections, all SAF aircraft participated in the airlift as planned. Two South African squadrons, numbers 31 and 34, flew missions from their base at Chelone in the Foggia district. They would take off at sunset and start the long and dangerous night journey to Warsaw. We took off. I seem to recall the mileage was 1760 miles, not kilometers, so it's quite a long way. We zigzagged over seven countries. It's never to be forgotten night in the stillness up at about 10 to 12,000 feet. When we came to the Carpathians, we had to climb to 12,000 feet to get over the icing which the cold weather would form on the leading edges of our wings. And uh, uh, our aircraft just seemed to take it in a stride. And I've literally been frozen in the turret. I've had icicles hanging off my oxygen mask. I mean, you're only sitting in a crouch position for 10 hours, right? And uh, there was quietness in the aircraft. Just occasionally, the pilot and myself just spoke. And uh, we uh, were on our way. 80% of the approximate 11 hour flight time was over enemy territory. German night fighters remained a constant threat and some of the bombers fell prey to their merciless attacks. Never keep your turret still. You sit there all the time, just sitting down the bars, swinging the turret from side to side. Even as there was nothing about, there could be something around. But the moonlight would reflect off the perspex when you moved. So he knew that the gunner was awake there and he would think twice about coming in to attack it. We were attacked by, uh, by night fighters from Krakow. And we were advised <coughs> by the intelligence that there would be a fighter base at Krakow. And then when he comes in to attack you, so invariably the first thing he does, he dips a wing like that and he starts to swing in like that and follow around his deflection. And you watched him and as soon as he dipped a wing to swing in, he'd shout, if he was above you, he'd shout, corkscrew starboard, go! And the skipper never argued, right? he, he, he slammed the wheel over and he went into a screaming turn. The last leg of navigation was made easier because Warsaw was a light. And then when we fell down the other side into Poland, the lowlands of Poland, we soon, soon could see a red glow, a red ball in the sky way ahead. And that was our target. Warsaw was in flames. I could see a city burn, not a house. Not a factory, but a city burn. And I could see the reflections of the buildings in the Vistula. Warsaw was accessed from the south along the Vistula, using the four bridges across the river as navigation reference points. Well, I could see the river Vistula as we came, you know, because uh, I could hear uh, the bombardier calling out Bridge One. Bridge two, bridge three. Things uh, took place. We came to the third bridge and our instructions were to turn left to port. That's left on the third bridge. And we would find the concentration, the old city of Warsaw, beautiful old city, was right there and that's how it was. And there you could just, through the haze, of anti-aircraft fire, of steel fragments being f fired at you, and searchlights. They were blinding, blinding. 
It really were terrible. And uh, we went in and when I thought we were spot on the place, I pressed the button and our load just fell away. They were attached to small parachutes. That was in an effort to make sure the goods we were delivering floated down safely and steadily and didn't smash on impact. Supplies were dropped in special waterproofed metal containers, each weighing 150 kilograms. Each aircraft carried up to 12 of these containers. The slow, low-flying aircraft were easy targets for the Germans to shoot down as the containers were released from an altitude of 450 feet at a flapped down airspeed. And we carried on. We saw the flak coming up. We saw the, the worst thing. You could see the fire coming at us. You could hear it as it rippled into the aircraft. Seeing all the flak bursts around and the city, I'd never seen in Britain city burning so much as it was, you know, and I thought, God, all those human beings down there. From the moment they went in, it was a blank until they, they managed to pull away. And uh, I can fully appreciate, and I did fully appreciate that because of the work that I did in the Western Desert, uh, what it was like to go in at 400 feet with your flaps down mm. and 140 kilometers, that even with a pea shooter you could hit the liberator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was in incredible, incredible. That, but yeah. they came back, those that came back, uh, they went again. The Warsaw supply drops in the months of August and September 1944 came at a very high cost with 43 Western Allies aircraft being destroyed. The sacrifice was immense. Estimated 256 aircrew were shot down with 215 lost. The SAF's 31 squadron suffered badly, losing half of its operational strength after its first three nights of operations. The men of 31 squadron were devastated. And after, after three trips, we had to stand down. We didn't have enough aircraft and we didn't have enough crews. We had to rebuild again from the beginning. It was a massacre. Feeling is the next day. The next day. Because you've come down, you've gone to briefing, you've had your coffee, you've had your marmite sandwiches and your peanut butter sandwiches. Let's get to bed. And it's the next day when you go to the mess for breakfast and you see the gaps. That's when it hits you. That's when it hits you. But there's always that feeling, thank God it's not me. There were many instances of character and bravery that were witnessed during these missions. Lieutenant Brian Jones was in the very first SAF aircraft to be shot down and it miraculously crash-landed safely at the Warsaw Airport. And then we pulled out and uh, uh, I gave Bob a southerly course to turn on and we were uh, heading home. And we were certain that we were climbing out of this but we didn't realize we had lost two engines in this maneuver. Instead of climbing out, we were falling. And the miracle, miracle was that we remained straight and level. My interpretation is that God himself got it and he was flying that aircraft because as we fell out of the sky, Thinking we were flying home, we missed all the tall trees and tall buildings, which you can see if you go to in our 
were in our path. And we leveled, we crashed onto a level piece of ground. We never spoke about crash landing. We never warned each other to get into crash landing mode, to brace up for the jolt of the thing. We had no intention of doing anything like that. We were going to get back to our squadron airfield thousands of miles away in Italy. The first I knew was um, I woke up and I had sand in my mouth. And I suppose I thought, that's strange. And then I realized we were on the ground. I spat the sand out and I heard Alf Falls guttural pronunciation and that saying to Bob, oh, well, Davies had it. He'll never get out of that. And I shouted out, no, I haven't. I'm here. Get me out of this place. And Bob said, use the chopper. Use the chopper. And in each section of the aircraft, there was a chopper strapped onto the wall. And in the darkness, I clambered up, found where it was strapped to the wall, pulled it out and hacked my way through the perspex and aluminium frame of the nose of a liberator. So chop, 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 bash my head against the thing and there I stood on the ground. And we were on terra firma. On the same night when Brian Jones's aircraft was shot down, another drama took place. Liberator K for King was severely damaged and on its way back. Suddenly, and without notifying the crew, the pilot went down below the flight deck and bailed out through the bomb bay doors. The inexperienced co-pilot, Lieutenant Robert Christopher Burgess, realized the situation and took control. He managed to recover the shot-up aircraft from a near-fatal dive and set course for Russia as he knew the aircraft would never make it back over the Carpathians to Italy. En route to Russia, Burgess had again to recover the stricken aircraft from dangerous flight situations. However, in the early hours of the following morning, Burgess made a perfect forced landing on Russian soil. For this display of bravery, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order. Lieutenant Burgess was the youngest and most junior SAF officer ever to receive this award. On the night of the 16th of August 1944, Lieutenant Johannes Grunewald was the co-pilot in Liberator P heading to Warsaw. Near Krakow, his aircraft was attacked by night fighters. The aircraft was hit and set on fire. The pilot, Major Woodendahl, immediately gave the order for the crew to bail out. Before this could happen, the Liberator exploded in mid-air. Grunewald lost consciousness, but regained it whilst free-falling through the air. He had been miraculously thrown clear of the aircraft by the explosion. Grunewald made a safe descent with his parachute. He was the only survivor of the eight-man crew. On the ground, his wounds were treated by poles of the resistance movement. Grunewald then served six months with the Polish resistance fighters until February 1945, when he was taken away by the Russians and returned to South Africa. With the fall of communism in 1989, the new democratic government of Poland at last had its chance to thank the airmen who helped the Home Army during the uprising. In 1992, 67 ex-members of SAF's 31 and 34 squadrons were awarded the Polish Warsaw Cross of the Uprising for their role in the relief operations. The other thing was the Poles were so grateful. I mean, they, they gave us three medals. And uh, wherever you went, not so much now, but wherever you went, you mentioned Warsaw, and they embraced you. You know, you, 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 they, they showed 
they showed their emotion, they displayed their emotion, and they wanted to express how happy they are that you made it. Several monuments honoring the brave air crews are to be seen in and around Warsaw. Most striking and solemn is the Commonwealth Cemetery in Krakow, where the fallen airmen are buried, always kept in pristine condition by the Poles. Today, a special bond exists between South Africa and Poland due to the relationship forged by those events in 1944. Every year, a special Warsaw Flights Commemoration Service is held at the Polish Katyn Memorial in Johannesburg. The Polish Embassy is always enthusiastically involved with the organization and generous sponsorship of these events. There has been a debate regarding the effectiveness and value of the Warsaw Airlift. Most are of the opinion that those costly missions were futile to the cause. Many participating airmen at the time realized this fact, but strict military discipline meant that orders were obeyed. The job had to be done. Men had to pay the price. All the benefit of the corporals marching us and counter-marching us in the parade ground on our trainings, initial training school came to fruition. It made us obey instructions instinctively and immediately. But the most important thing, it was as Churchill said, it was a symbol, a token. We have not forgotten you. Maybe the Russians have, but we have not. We've sent our boys to help out as best as they can. Within the SAF ranks was a young Christian navigator, Lieutenant Eric Impey. He was a tentmate of Brian Jones. He wrote a poem to his fellow airmen. Two days thereafter, he was killed on a Warsaw mission. My God, this night I have to fly, and ere I leave the ground, I come with reverence to thy throne, where perfect peace is found. I thank thee for the life I had, for home and all its love. I thank thee for the faith I have that cometh from above. Come with me now into the air, be with me as I fly. Guide thou each move that I shall make way up there in the sky. Be with me at the target, Lord, when danger is at its height. Be with me as I drop my load and on the homeward flight. And should it be my time to die, be with me to the end. Help me to die a Christian's death, on thee, God, I depend. Then as I leave this mortal frame, from human ties set free, receive my soul, O God of love, I humbly come to thee. Landing after a nap was a marvelous thing. When you tumble out of the belly of a liberator and you try to do two things simultaneously to light a cigarette and to have a pee and it's not easy and then the warmth of the ground crew to have you back you're their boy they love you and that's all there is to it if they prayed they prayed for us. I think sometimes it's a bit selfish because there is that feeling of thank God I'm around, thank God I made it.